Chapter Seven of The Road by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven Road Kids and Gay Cats. Every once in a while, in newspapers, magazines, and biographical dictionaries, I run upon sketches of my life wherein, delicately phrased, I learned that it was in order to study sociology that I became a tramp. This is very nice and thoughtful of the biographers, but it is inaccurate. I became a tramp, well, because of the life that was in me, of the wanderlust in my blood that would not let me rest. Sociology was merely incidental. It came afterward, in the same manner that a wet skin follows a ducking. I went on the road because I couldn't keep away from it because I hadn't the price of a railroad fare in my jeans, because I was so made that I couldn't work all my life on one same shift, because, well, just because it was easier than not to. It happened in my own town in Oakland when I was sixteen. At that time I had attained a dizzy reputation in my chosen circle of adventurers, by whom I was known as the Prince of the Oyster Pirates. It is true, those immediately outside my circle, such as honest bay sailors, longshoremen, yachtsmen, and legal owners of the oysters, called me tough, hoodlum, smouge, thief, robber, and various other not nice things, all of which was complimentary, and but served to increase the dizziness of the high place in which I sat. At that time I had not read Paradise Lost, and later, when I read Milton's Better to Reign in Hell Than Serve in Heaven, I was fully convinced that great minds run in the same channels. It was at this time that the fortuitous concatenation of events sent upon me my first adventure on the road. It happened that there was nothing doing in oysters just then. Then, at Benicia, forty miles away, I had some blankets I wanted to get, and that at Port Costa, several miles from Benicia, a stolen boat lay at anchor in charge of the constable. Now this boat was owned by a friend of mine, by the name Dinny McCree. It had been stolen and left at Port Costa by Whiskey Bob, another friend of mine. Poor Whiskey Bob. Only last winter his body was picked up on the beach shot full of holes by nobody knows whom. I had come down from upriver some time before, and reported to Dinny McCree the whereabouts of his boat, and Dinny McCree had promptly offered ten dollars to me if I should bring it down to Oakland to him. Time was heavy on my hands. I sat on the dock and talked it over with Nicky the Greek, another idle oyster pirate. Let's go, said I, and Nicky was willing. He was broke. I possessed fifty cents and a small skiff. The former I invested and loaded into the latter in the form of crackers, canned corned beef, and a ten-cent bottle of French mustard. We were keen on French mustard in those days. Then, late in the afternoon, we hoisted our small sprit sail and started. We sailed all night, and next morning, on the first of a glorious flood tide, a fair wind behind us, we came booming up the Carquinez Straits to Port Costa. There lay the stolen boat, not twenty-five feet from the wharf. We ran alongside and doused our little sprit sail. I sent Nicky forward to lift the anchor, while I began casting off the gaskets. A man ran out on the wharf and hailed us. It was the constable. It suddenly came to me that I had neglected to get a written authorization from Dinny McCree to take possession of his boat. Also, I knew that constable wanted to charge at least twenty-five dollars in fees for capturing the boat from Whiskey Bob and subsequently taking care of it. And my last fifty cents had been blown in for corned beef and French mustard, and the reward was only ten dollars anyway. I shot a glance forward to Nicky. He had the anchor up and down and was straining at it. Break her out, I whispered to him, and turned and shouted back to the constable. The result was that he and I were talking at the same time, our spoken thoughts colliding in mid-air and making gibberish. The constable grew more imperative, and perforce I had to listen. Nicky was heaving on the anchor till I thought he'd burst a blood vessel. When the constable got done with his threats and warnings, I asked him who he was. The time he lost in telling me enabled Nicky to break out the anchor. I was doing some quick calculating. At the feet of the constable, a ladder ran down the dock to the water, and to the ladder was moored a skiff. The oars were in it. But it was padlocked. I gambled everything on that padlock. I felt the breeze on my cheek, saw the surge of the tide, looked at the remaining gaskets that confined the sail, 
ran my eyes up the halyards to the blocks, and knew that all was clear, and then threw off all dissimulation. In with her, I shouted to Nicky, and sprang to the gaskets, casting them loose and thanking my stars that Whiskey Bob had tied them in square knots instead of grannies. The constable had slid down the ladder and was fumbling with a key at the padlock. The anchor came aboard, and the last gasket was loosed at the same instant that the constable freed the skiff and jumped to the oars. Peak halyards, I commanded my crew, at the same time swinging on to the throat halyards. Up came the sail on the run. I belayed and ran aft to the tiller. Stretcher, I shouted to Nicky at the peak. The constable was just reaching for our stern. A puff of wind caught us, and we shot away. It was great. If I'd had a black flag, I know I'd have run it up in triumph. The constable stood up in the skiff and paled the glory of the day with the vividness of his language. Also, he wailed for a gun. You see, that was another gamble we had taken. Anyway, we weren't stealing the boat. It wasn't the constable's. We were merely stealing his fees, which was his particular form of graft. And we weren't stealing the fees for ourselves, either. We were stealing them for my friend, Dinny McCree. Benicia was made in a few minutes, and a few minutes later my blankets were aboard. I shifted the boat down to the far end of Steamboat Wharf, from which point of vantage we could see anybody coming after us. There was no telling. Maybe the Port Costa constable would telephone to the Benicia constable. Nicky and I held a council of war. We lay on deck in the warm sun, the fresh breeze on our cheeks, the flood tide rippling and swirling past. It was impossible to start back to Oakland till afternoon, when the ebb tide would begin to run. But we figured that the constable would have an eye out on the Carquinez Straits when the ebb started, and that nothing remained for us but to wait for the following ebb, at two o'clock next morning, when we could slip by Cerebus in the darkness. So we lay on deck, smoked cigarettes, and were glad that we were alive. I spat over the side and gauged the speed of the current. With this wind, we could run this flood clear to Rio Vista, I said. And it's fruit time on the river, said Nicky. And low water on the river, said I. It's the best time of the year to make Sacramento. We sat up and looked at each other. The glorious west wind was pouring over us like wine. We both spat over the side and gauged the current. Now I contend that it was all the fault of that flood tide and fair wind. They appealed to our sailor instinct. If it had not been for them, the whole chain of events that was put to me upon the road would have broken down. We said no word, but cast off our moorings and hoisted sail. Our adventures up the Sacramento River are no part of this narrative. We subsequently made the city of Sacramento and tied up at a wharf. The water was fine, and we spent most of our time in swimming. On the sandbar above the railroad bridge, we fell in with a bunch of boys likewise in swimming. Between swims, we lay on the bank and talked. They talked differently from the fellows I had been used to herding with. It was a new vernacular. They were road kids, and with every word they uttered, the lure of the road laid hold of me more imperiously. When I was down in Alabama, one kid would begin, or another, coming up on the C&A from K.C., whereat a third kid, on the C&A there ain't no steps to the blinds, and I would lie silently in the sand and listen. It was a little town in Ohio on the lake shore in Michigan Southern, a kid would start, and another, ever ride on the cannonball on the Wabash? And yet another, nope, but I've been on the white mail out of Chicago. Talk about railroading, wait till you hit the Pennsylvania. Four tracks, no water tanks, take water on the fly, that's going some. The Northern Pacific's a bad road now. Salinas is on the hog, the bulls is horse-style. I got pinched at El Paso along with Moat Kid. Talking about pokeouts, wait till you hit the French country out of Montreal. Not a word of English. You say, Mon G, madam, Mon G, no speak of the French, and rub your stomach and look hungry, and she gives you a slice of sow belly and a chunk of dry punk. And I continued to lie in the sand and listen. These wanderers made my oyster piracy look like thirty cents. A new world was calling to me in every word that was spoken. A world of rods and gunnels, blind baggages and side-door pullmans, bulls and shacks, floppings and chewins, pinches and getaways, strong arms and bindle stiffs, punks and profesh. And it all spelled adventure. Very well. I would tackle this new world. I lined myself up alongside those road kids. I was just as strong as any of them.
just as quick, just as nervy, and my brain was just as good. After the swim, as evening came on, they dressed and went uptown. I went along. The kids began battering the main stem for light pieces, or in other words, begging for money on the main street. I had never begged in my life, and this was the hardest thing for me to stomach when I first went on the road. I had absurd notions about begging. My philosophy, up to that time, was that it was finer to steal than to beg, and that robbery was finer still because the risk and the penalty were proportionately greater. As an oyster pirate I had already earned convictions at the hands of justice, which, if I had tried to serve them, would have required a thousand years in state's prison. To rob was manly, to beg was sordid and despicable. But I developed in the days to come all right, all right, till I came to look upon begging as a joyous prank, a game of wits, a nerve exerciser. That first night, however, I couldn't rise to it, and the result was that when the kids were ready to go to a restaurant and eat, I wasn't. I was broke. Meanie Kid, I think it was, gave me the price, and we all ate together. But while I ate, I meditated. The receiver, it was said, was as bad as the thief. Meany Kid had done the begging, and I was profiting by it. I decided that the receiver was a whole lot worse than the thief, and that it shouldn't happen again, and it didn't. I turned out next day and threw my feet as well as the next one. Nicky the Greek's ambition didn't run to the road. He was not a success at throwing his feet, and he stowed away one night on a barge and went down river to San Francisco. I met him only a week ago at a pugilistic carnival. He has progressed. He sat in a place of honor at the ringside. He is now a manager of prize fighters and proud of it. In fact, in a small way, in local sportdom, he is quite a shining light. No kid is a road kid until he has gone over the hill. Such was the law of the road I heard expounded in Sacramento. All right, I'd go over the hill and matriculate. The hill, by the way, was the Sierra Nevadas. The whole gang was going over the hill on a jaunt, and of course I'd go along. It was French Kid's first adventure on the road. He had just run away from his people in San Francisco. It was up to him and me to deliver the goods. In passing, I may remark that my old title of prince had vanished. I had received my monica. I was now Sailor Kid, later to be known as Frisco Kid, when I had put the Rockies between me and my native state. At 10.20 p.m., the Central Pacific Overland pulled out of the depot at Sacramento for the east. That particular item of timetable is indelibly engraved on my memory. There were about a dozen in our gang, and we strung out in the darkness ahead of the train, ready to take her out. All the local road kids that we knew came down to see us off, also to ditch us if they could. That was their idea of a joke, and there was only about forty of them to carry it out. Their ringleader was a crackerjack road kid named Bob. Sacramento was his home town, but he'd hit the road pretty well everywhere over the whole country. He took French Kid and me aside and gave us advice something like this. We're going to try and ditch your bunch, see? Yous two are weak. The rest of the push can take care of itself. So as soon as yous two nail a blind, deck her. And stay on the decks till yous pass Roseville Junction, at which burg the constables are horstile, sloughing in everybody on sight. The engine whistled and the overland pulled out. There were three blinds on her, room for all of us. The dozen of us who were trying to make her out would have preferred to slip aboard quietly, but our forty friends crowded on with the most amazing and shameless publicity and advertisement. Following Bob's advice, I immediately decked her, that is, climbed up on top of the roof of one of the mail cars. There I lay down, my heart jumping a few extra beats, and listened to the fun. The whole train crew was forward, and the ditching went on fast and furious. After the train had run half a mile, it stopped, and the crew came forward again and ditched the survivors. I alone had made the train out. Back at the depot, about him, two or three of the push that had witnessed the accident, lay French Kid with both legs off. French Kid had slipped or stumbled, that was all, and the wheels had done the rest. Such was my initiation to the road. It was two years afterward when I next saw French Kid and examined his stumps. This was an act of courtesy. Cripples always like to have their stumps examined. One of the entertaining sights on the road is to witness the meeting of two cripples. Their common disability is a fruitful source of conversation. And they tell how it happened, describe what they know of the amputation, 
pass critical judgment on their own and each other's surgeons, and wind up by withdrawing to one side, taking off bandages and wrappings, and comparing stumps. But it was not until several days later, over in Nevada, when the push caught up with me, that I learned of French Kid's accident. The push itself arrived in bad condition. It had gone through a train wreck in the snow sheds. Happy Joe was on crutches with two mashed legs, and the rest were nursing skins and bruises. In the meantime, I lay on the roof of the mail car, trying to remember whether Roseville Junction, against which Berg, Bob, had warned me, was the first stop or the second stop. To make sure, I delayed descending the platform of the blind until after the second stop, and then I didn't descend. I was new to the game, and I felt safer where I was. But I never told the push that I held down the decks the whole night, clear across the Sierras, through snow sheds and tunnels, and down to Truckee on the other side, where I arrived at seven in the morning. Such a thing was disgraceful, and I'd have been a common laughingstock. This is the first time I have confessed the truth about that first ride over the hill. As for the push, it decided that I was all right, and when I came back over the hill to Sacramento, I was a full-fledged road kid. Yet, I had much to learn. Bob was my mentor, and he was all right. I remember one evening, it was fair time in Sacramento, and we were knocking about and having a good time, when I lost my hat in a fight. There was I, bareheaded in the street, and it was Bob to the rescue. He took me to one side from the push and told me what to do. I was a bit timid of his advice. I had just come out of jail, where I had been three days, and I knew that if the police pinched me again, I'd get good and soaked. On the other hand, I couldn't show the white feather. I'd been over the hill, I was running full-fledged with the push, and it was up to me to deliver the goods. So I accepted Bob's advice, and he came along with me to see that I did it up brown. We took our position on K Street, on the corner, I think, of Fifth. It was early in the evening, and the street was crowded. Bob studied the headgear of every Chinaman that passed. I used to wonder how the road kids all managed to wear five-dollar Stetson stim riffs, and now I knew. They got them, the way I was going to get mine, from the Chinese. I was nervous. There were so many people about, but Bob was cool as an iceberg. Several times when I started forward toward a Chinaman, all nerved and keyed up, Bob dragged me back. He wanted me to get a good hat, and one that fitted. Now a hat came by that was the right size, but not new and after a dozen impossible hats, along would come one that was new, but not the right size. And when one did come by that was new and the right size, the rim was too large or not large enough. My, Bob was finicky. I was so wrought up that I'd have snatched any kind of a head covering. At last came the hat, the one hat in Sacramento for me. I knew it was a winner as soon as I looked at it. I glanced at Bob. He sent a sweeping look about for police, then nodded his head. I lifted the hat from the Chinaman's head and pulled it down on my own. It was a perfect fit. Then I started. I heard Bob crying out, and I caught a glimpse of him blocking the irate Mongolian and tripping him up. I ran on. I turned up the next corner and around the next. This street was not so crowded as K, and I walked along in quietude, catching my breath and congratulating myself upon my hat and my getaway. And then suddenly, around the corner at my back, came the bareheaded Chinaman. With him were a couple more Chinamen, and at their heels were half a dozen men and boys. I sprinted to the next corner, crossed the street, and rounded the following corner. I decided that I had surely played him out, and I dropped into a walk again. But around the corner at my heels came that persistent Mongolian. It was the old story of the hare and the tortoise. He could not run so fast as I, but he stayed with it, plodding along at a shambling and deceptive trot, and wasting much good breath in noisy imprecations. He called all Sacramento to witness the dishonor that had been done him, and a goodly portion of Sacramento heard and flocked at his heels. And I ran on like the hare, and ever that persistent Mongolian, with the increasing rabble, overhauled me. But finally, when a policeman had joined his following, I let out all my links. I twisted and turned, and I swear I ran at least twenty blocks on the straightaway. And I never saw that Chinaman again. The hat was a dandy, a brand new Stetson, just out of the shop, and it was the envy of the whole push. Furthermore, it was the symbol that I had delivered the goods. I wore it for over a year. Road kids are nice little chaps. When you get them alone and they are telling you how it happened, but take my word for it, 
Watch out for them when they run in pack. Then they are wolves, and like wolves they are capable of dragging down the strongest man. At such times they are not cowardly. They will fling themselves upon a man and hold on with every ounce of strength in their wiry bodies till he is thrown and helpless. More than once have I seen them do it, and I know whereof I speak. Their motive is usually robbery, and watch out for the strong arm. Every kid in the push I traveled with was expert at it. Even French kid mastered it before he lost his legs. I have strong upon me now a vision of what I once saw in the Willows. The Willows was a clump of trees in a waste piece of land near the railroad depot and not more than five minutes' walk from the heart of Sacramento. It is night time, and the scene is illumined by the thin light of stars. I see a husky laborer in the midst of a pack of road kids. He is infuriated and cursing them, not a bit afraid, confident of his own strength. He weighs about 180 pounds, and his muscles are hard, but he doesn't know what he is up against. The kids are snarling. It is not pretty. They make a rush from all sides, and he lashes out and whirls. Barber Kid is standing beside me. As the man whirls, Barber Kid leaps forward and does the trick. Into the man's back goes his knee, around the man's neck from behind passes his right hand, the bone of the wrist pressing against the jugular vein. Barber Kid throws his whole weight backward. It is a powerful leverage. Besides, the man's wind has been cut off. It is the strong arm. The man resists, but he is already practically helpless. The road kids are upon him from every side, clinging to arms and legs and body, and like a wolf at the throat of a moose, Barber Kid hangs on and drags backward. Over the man goes, and down under the heap. Barber Kid changes the position of his own body, but never lets go. While some of the kids are going through the victim, others are holding his legs so that he cannot kick and thresh about. They improve the opportunity by taking off the man's shoes. As for him, he has given in. He is beaten. Also, what of the strong arm at his throat, he is short of wind. He is making ugly choking noises, and the kids hurry. They really don't want to kill him. All is done. At a word, all holds are released at once, and the kids scatter, one of them lugging the shoes. He knows where he can get half a dollar for them. The man sits up and looks about him, dazed and helpless. Even if he wanted to, barefooted pursuit in the darkness would be hopeless. I linger a moment and watch him. He is feeling at his throat, making dry, hawking noises, and jerking his head in a quaint way, as though to ensure himself that the neck is not dislocated. Then I slip away to join the push, and see that man no more, though I shall always see him, sitting there in the starlight, somewhat dazed, a bit frightened, greatly disheveled, and making quaint, jerking movements of head and neck. Drunken men are the especial prey of the road kids. Robbing a drunken man they call rolling a stiff and wherever they are, they are on the constant lookout for drunks. The drunk is their particular meat, as the fly is the particular meat of the spider. The rolling of a stiff is oft times an amusing sight, especially when the stiff is helpless and when interference is unlikely. At the first swoop, the stiff's money and jewelry go. Then the kids sit around their victim in a sort of powwow. A kid generates a fancy for the stiff's necktie. Off it comes. Another kid is after underclothes. Off they come, and a knife quickly abbreviates arms and legs. Friendly hobos may be called in to take the coat and trousers, which are too large for the kids, and in the end they depart, leaving beside the stiff the heap of their discarded rags. Another vision comes to me. It is a dark night. My push is coming along the sidewalk in the suburbs. Ahead of us, under an electric light, a man crosses the street diagonally. There is something tentative and dulcitory in his walk. The kids scent the game on the instant. The man is drunk. He blunders across the opposite sidewalk and is lost in the darkness as he takes a shortcut through a vacant lot. No hunting cry is raised, but the pack flings itself forward in quick pursuit. In the middle of the vacant lot it comes upon him. But what is this? Snarling and strange forms, small and dim and menacing, are between the pack and its prey. It is another pack of road kids and in the hostile pause we learn that it is their meat, that they have been trailing it a dozen blocks and more, and that we are butting in. But it is the world primeval. These wolves are baby wolves. As a matter of fact, I don't think one of them was over twelve or thirteen years of age. 
I met some of them afterward, and learned that they had just arrived that day over the hill, and that they hailed from Denver and Salt Lake City. Our pack flings forward. The baby wolves squeal and screech and fight like little demons. All about the drunken man rages the struggle for the possession of him. Down he goes in the thick of it, and the battle rages over his body after the fashion of the Greeks and Trojans over the body and armor of a fallen hero. Amid cries and tears and wailings, the baby wolves are dispossessed, and my pack rolls the stiff. But always I remember the poor stiff and his befuddled amazement at the abrupt eruption of battle in the vacant lot. I see him now, dim in the darkness, titubating in stupid wonder, good-naturedly essaying the role of peacemaker, in that multitudinous scrap the significance of which he did not understand, and the really hurt expression on his face when he, unoffending he, was clutched at by many hands and dragged down in the thick of the press. Bindlestiffs are favorite prey of the road kids. A bindlestiff is a working tramp. He takes his name from the roll of blankets he carries, which is known as a bindle. Because he does work, a bindled stiff is expected usually to have some small change about him, and it is after that small change that the road kids go. The best hunting ground for bindle stiffs is in the sheds, barns, lumber yards, railroad yards, etc., on the edges of a city, and the time for hunting is the night, when the bindle stiff seeks these places to roll up his blankets and sleep. Gay cats also come to grief at the hands of the road kid. In more familiar parlance, gay cats are shorthorns, chachaquas, new chums, or tenderfeet. A gay cat is a newcomer on the road who is a man grown, or at least youth grown. A boy on the road, on the other hand, no matter how green he is, is never a gay cat. He is a road kid or a punk, and if he travels with a profesh, he is known possessively as a Prussian. I was never a Prussian, for I did not take kindly to possession. I was first a road kid and then a profesh. Because I started in young, I practically skipped my gay cat apprenticeship. For a short period, during the time I was exchanging my Frisco Kid Monica for that of Sailor Jack, I labored under the suspicion of being a gay cat. But closer acquaintance on the part of those that suspected me quickly disabused their minds, and in a short time I acquired the unmistakable airs and earmarks of the blowed in the glass profesh. And be it known, here and now, that the profesh are the aristocracy of the road. They are the lords and masters, the aggressive men, the primordial noblemen, the blond beasts so beloved of Netschke. When I came back over the hill from Nevada, I found that some river pilot had stolen Dinny McCree's boat. A funny thing at this day is that I cannot remember what became of the skiff in which Nicky the Greek and I sailed from Oakland to Port Costa. I know that the constable didn't get it, and I know that it didn't go with us up the Sacramento River, and that is all I do know. With the loss of Dinny McCree's boat, I was pledged to the road, and when I grew tired of Sacramento, I said goodbye to the push which, in its friendly way, tried to ditch me from a freight as I left town, and started on a passer down the valley of the San Joaquin. The road had gripped me and would not let me go. And later, when I had voyaged to sea and done one thing and another, I returned to the road to make longer flights, to be a comet and a profesh, and to plump into the bath of sociology that wet me to the skin. End of chapter 7